ultimately today whatever we do whether it's your banking whether it's your contracts whether it's your online business whether it's anything that you do electronic today that's turned out to be uh, the legal uh, uh, reality only because of information technology act so when the moment we are making out uh, uh, online business specifically uh, mobile applications or or uh, uh, websites or uh, having your own uh, uh, applications or platforms and the like i think everything today whatever we do digitally i think the whole recognition um, uh, of it from a legal perspective is given by the information technology act thanks to this law next slide please so i think this is a very very new generation law because it's just about 20 years old and then however it is uh, i can just say that it's not adequate enough there still needs to be a lot of amendments done to this law because this is one piece of legislation that is completely going to be technology dependent so in order to uh, be in sync with the growing technology i think the law is slightly left behind but nevertheless i think there are some uh, marvelous uh, provisions that we are going to discuss as we go forward next slide please so in india largely we have we have uh, 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 an indian cyber law in the form of information technology act and uh, it was introduced in the year 2000 and uh, an amendment also was brought about in the year 2008 and more specifically uh, we also have certain rules and regulations which have uh, framed there under and i would like to talk of one piece of uh, rules that is it rules 2011 they hold a significant place in terms of doing business online i think these are the three golden mantras Uh, for any business entity that is trying to use computers computer systems computer networks and also digital uh, information and electronic data i think fundamentally uh, cyber law today is largely uh, um, comprised in within these three parameters so if you are a business if you are a business entity if you are a corporate uh, uh, businessman if you are a startup if you are an entrepreneur i think primarily you will have to stay focused and understand the legal nuances behind this law because uh, we live in a country which says ignorance of law is no excuse uh, next slide please there are lots of issues that are happening currently uh, with regard to this uh, legislation and more specifically like i told you anything that is done digital uh, uh, would would assume legal significance uh, because of information technology act other than four things there are four things that the law does not recognize when they are in electronic form the first one is power of attorney then uh, will a trusted a negotiable instrument other than check and any sale document of immo immovable property i think if you have any of these even in the electronic format i think the law will not recognize it but other than this anything that you do digital is going to give a legal validity by this information technology act and primarily it's a facilitating uh, legislation it's not a penal statute we have uh, something like uh, uh, the ipc indian penal code which, which is a criminal statute which specifically talks about uh, the various offenses and the penalties so in short i would say uh, the cyber law is nothing but a mix of all the legislations with an e added to it whether it's civil criminal corporate or land or family or uh, banking and the like i think uh, fundamentally with everything going digital i think uh, this is going to be one of the most important mother legislation as we go forward uh, next slide please so primarily i would like to tell you that uh, an interesting statement that has been made so uh, with the, the recent supreme court's judgment i think we we'll lot will all have to be cognizant to the fact that right to privacy is now being made a fundamental right so i just thought of depicting this picture though the copyright is with the owner i just here uh, intended to display that so as to make you aware about the uh, uh, implication regarding privacy i think right to privacy is no longer going to be uh, the uh, dark line it's going to Uh, uh, be a center stage attention because uh, it's now being made a fundamental right of every indian citizen so no matter whether it's a company or no matter if it's an employee a consultant and anybody i think primarily you'll have to realize that protecting privacy is the only mantra that uh, businesses have to adopt in this digital era next slide please so i just thought of sharing certain basic concepts with you before i go through on my presentation and uh, so that it will help you and me to to understand uh, and then put things in a better place so the moment you're creating anything uh, electronic that is any document any image any any video that you create using a computer or a mobile phone today can become an electronic record so your emails uh, your whatsapp conversations your facebook posts and then your uh, tweets and your uh, conversations that are happening through skype and the uh, webinars like this all of them are considered to be electronic records specifically under section 21t of the information technology act what does that mean that means that uh, 
anytime I create uh, any of these records, um, I can call that as an electronic record. And there's a process that needs to be adopted with regard to how you can authenticate and, uh, and ensure legal validity to such electronic transactions uh, as we go forward. Next slide, please. So I just I'd like to talk of one big area that businesses need to keep under keep in mind. It's something called public key infrastructure. So I just put it in a very simple way so that uh, I don't want to go too legal on it. See, I'm sure that uh, people here uh, would have watched uh, certain movies, especially if you look at the uh, old uh, uh, regional movies, uh, specifically the movies which had gangsters and criminals. I don't really mean to refer to them, but I just want to draw an example so that it can make your life very easy. So we've seen a lot of movies like uh, Dawn and things like that, where you know a lot of smuggling activities take, took place. And usually, what happens in those smuggling activities? Uh, there is a code being given to uh, the parties, or there is a hundred rupee note which is cut into two parts. One is vested with the other part, and the other is vested with the another party. Only when they come together, they show these, and then they uh, they have some kind of matching. Only then they try to transact business. I think uh, public key infrastructure is something similar to that. You have something called a private key. You have something called a public key. The public key is known to the public. The private key is only known to that respective business house. And typically, all of these are issued by an authority called certifying authority. So typically, I think all businesses who are filing their uh, income tax returns and GST returns would have been aware of this because they make use of it, something called digital signature in order to file their returns. I think typically, you will have to understand that there's a public key, there's a private key. Only once both of them get authenticated, a document stands uh, validated. So this is the only thing that I would like to talk of uh, in terms of electronic records. So you're putting up your email, ensure that you're encrypting and decrypting it using your keys. So ideally, I see that there are a lot of uh, email applications that you're making use, whether it's the Microsoft Outlook, or whether it's the Gmails of the world, whether it's, or whether it's the Yahoo's of the world, whether it's a corporate network. I think everywhere there's an option that you can make use of that is affix and sign the email digitally. I think doing that would actually bring in a lot of legal uh, uh, things into picture because it's going to be uh, stating that email more legally authentic in the eyes of law. Next slide, please. Um, more, next slide, please. More specifically, I would like to talk of uh, in this context of relating to e contracts. See, I think today, when we all are uh, in the digital uh, environment, we are making use of various amounts of e contracts with or without a knowledge. So, the classical example that I would like to relate here is when you create your email, what happens when you sign up on an uh, email? Typically, let's take an example of Gmail. Um, when you start creating an email, typically, there are terms and conditions that you make use of. And then you need to accept and agree going forward to create your email account. I think these are all e-contracts that we are uh, signing up with or without our knowledge. The same thing happens when you make a purchase of um, any kinds of uh, products on these e-commerce platforms or the marketplaces, whether it's the Amazons or the, the, the Flipkarts or whether they are uh, Snap deals of the world. I think anything that you're making use of today for the purpose of purchasing your products, you're agreeing to the terms and conditions and the policies mentioned thereof. So what does it mean? That means that it's an e-contract that you're making use of. So e-contracts typically for businesses can be in three formats. One is click, one is shrink, another is browse. So click is when you make use of something called I agree. When you click on something called I agree, I accept. So that typical form of contract is called a click wrap contract. And shrink, when you purchase uh, some kinds of um, uh, CDs or DVDs from market, you're agreeing to the terms and conditions. For example, if you're purchasing any kinds of uh, um, Microsoft Office or antivirus tools or uh, the operating systems, and typically when you make a purchase of them in the physical market, there's a sheet of terms and conditions that, that, that is mentioned at the back of the uh, CD. So typically you're agreeing to it by making a purchase. That's called shrink wrap. Browse wrap. Obviously, when you're browsing out various applications or the websites, and when you're downloading mobile applications, when you're making use of platforms, you typically have terms and conditions which you make use of. I think ideally, these are three typical forms of e-contracts that companies are trying to make use of for their business and for the purpose of their uh, uh, trading and uh, other aspects. So I think uh, if you're a business, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're a startup, or if you're a corporate, um, or if uh, or, and making use of any kinds of uh, websites or mobile applications, I think e-contracts would have to be primarily looked at uh, the tip of the iceberg, more specifically in this light of uh, online ecosystem. 
and apart from that the, the, we we also have certain things called electronic signatures and digital signatures well digital signatures as you all are aware that uh, are typically issued by a certifying authority and then uh, they are given to you in a usb token typically your your chartered accountant or the company secretary makes use of this uh, uh, to order to file your returns i think uh, you can also make use of this when you're making out client conversations through emails or, uh, or or transacting any kinds of businesses using emails because the moment you are affixing your digital signature or the electronic signature you are adding more authenticity to it and specifically uh, that becomes uh, uh, an authenticity uh, to the electronic record which is the email and then it can be used in the court of law as a valid legal evidence so uh, this is a very important fact that i would like to talk of because everybody no matter it's a small or a medium or a large scale enterprise everybody is making use of these signatures for the purpose of doing uh, their uh, returns and other tax compliances i think in this domain if you basically try to understand and take up the right class uh, of digital signature for your business purpose i think that can save a lot of time and energy and especially during this pandemic uh, situation you can try to enter into contracts with clients vendors as well as also pass on your uh, legal policies to your employees with the help of uh, and ask them to sign using this digital signatures i think this is going to be one of the key areas that you can uh, focus on uh, especially in order to attribute a uh, nexus to that particular document next slide please i think typically uh, anything that you do electronic whether it's your uh, conversations or the documents or uh, any kinds of uh, emails or, or or videos audios anything that you do digitally is now going to be increasingly used as digital evidence so i would say that think twice before you do anything digital i'll tell you of this case which has happened uh, uh, which has come to me a long time ago uh, there was a company um, there was a business house typically wherein they started communicating uh, their roles and responsibilities uh, of uh, the employees through email and typically the employee was assigned tasks by their uh, reporting manager and then they were supposed to report back to the manager unfortunately there was one employee who did not pay any kinds of attention to this particular instructions being given to him electronically however in the rage of frustration um, the reporting manager sent out an email abusing uh, the corporate employee of uh, 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 using derogatory and defamatory language and then uh, he put up his frustration through that email and lo and behold what has happened is that uh, this particular employee did not abuse the employee um, the uh, manager back but however he went up to the police station and uh, took screenshots of this message and then mail and then uh, registered a criminal case against uh, the uh, the reporting manager for defamation i think it's a wake up call that everybody you need to realize that uh, when you're making use of the digital or the electronic environment i think you'll have to quickly realize that uh, you cannot do out uh, anything that wipes out the information completely i think we'll have to quickly realize that uh, we need to be uh, caution uh, while we're making and uh, any kinds of posts uh, which includes when sharing out your frustration i think this is a corporate learning that everyone who's using this uh, digital environment needs to be really uh, apprised of in order to ensure that they do not land up in the wrong side of uh, litigation and then uh, instead of uh, suing the employee getting sued is going to be a completely different paradigm altogether uh, next slide please ideally when uh, you you're trying to make use of uh, digital environment i will say that you should act with care and caution because um there could be a lot of evidence and trail that that could be left behind uh, these uh, digital transactions next slide please yeah i just what wanted to talk of certain cyber crimes uh, in the light of businesses so as to ensure that uh, uh, to bring about an awareness in the uh, business ecosystem regarding uh, uh, some kinds of crimes of course these are just illustrative and not exhaustive um phishing is one of the most commonly uh, uh, occurring cyber crime with regard to online businesses and specifically with regard to business houses uh, phishing is nothing but creating fake login pages uh, just like it's uh, the original it's i can almost say it's a look like so basically if you're trying to have any kinds of uh, websites or if you are trying to have any kinds of mobile applications or the platforms you need to clearly ensure that you are not um, facing these kinds of issues what happens uh, uh, largely is uh when you typically have websites relating to your online business they could be look likes a lot of times 
and then this could be used primarily uh, to uh, bypass uh, the security measures and not just that a lot of data collection could happen through this particular phishing websites i think nobody is immune because uh, anybody that's there any website that's there on the computer network i think you have to understand that that phishing is going to be one of the most increasing cyber crime that you are likely to be hit now uh, nevertheless we have also have the identity thefts of the world because thanks to the internet this has made and, and ensured anonymity to the users so so much so that uh, today uh, when you are trying to have any kinds of uh, transactions with anybody online we, we quickly have to understand that uh, identifying and uh, relating to that particular individual is going to be one of the most important uh, uh, legal challenge as also business challenge because you do not know who is exactly behind that uh, who's chatting with you whether it's a genuine one or whether it's a fake one we don't have any clue i think identity thefts are also in the new flavor of the times so ransomware has become the new corporate jewel in the crown why because uh, there's there's a lot of things happening across this particular crime called ransomware so earlier we might have heard of extortions wherein people started um, uh, kidnapping somebody demanding uh, extort i mean uh, ransom and then doing a lot of extortion activities and now uh, thanks to this uh, uh, domain called the internet i think it's taken the totally uh, new paradigm altogether today uh, ransomware attacks have become uh, one of the most uh, new flavor of the times why everybody is now facing this kinds of attacks we also had the corporate giant cognizant who actually was hit with a big ransomware attack now just uh, yesterday we also had uh, an information that honda company had also been uh, hit with something called the snake uh, ransomware that's now uh, of course there are no official confirmations regarding the same but yes what happens in this kind of a scenario is that you typically uh, uh, get your uh, devices uh, get a message that your devices have been locked and you're typically asked to pay a certain amount as ransom which is typically in a cryptocurrency called bitcoins and only if that is transferred the uh, data uh, or, and the devices are been released so it's going to be a very very different paradigm because there are a lot of professional personal and social data that you make use of in a device and more specifically in the light of businesses when they store a large amount of confidential business information this is going to become uh, a very important aspect because if your information is sitting on the fence i think uh, it's going to be uh, opening up a new box of legal exposures to criminals and uh, cyber attackers corporate data theft is nevertheless going to be uh, one another jewel of the crown because uh, uh, more specifically in this land of pandemic as also uh, in the light of uh, having uh, uh, corporate data shared across various uh, systems without any pro proper protection i think that's going to be increasingly exposing the data of uh, corporates and business houses to cyber criminals so ip issues are going to also be uh, the new toast of the times because with a lot of intellectual property uh, uh, coming up whether it's trademarks or the copyrights and the like and the patents and the trade secrets i think it's going to be completely a different paradigm altogether why because uh, there's going to be a lot of intellectual property generated out of your business uh, whether whether you're a service based company or a product based company or you do any kinds of uh, business which is involving information or data in the electronic format i think more specifically in the light of this there would definitely be two kinds of issues that you could face with one with regard to your trademark one with regard to your copyright i think copyright is going to be largely Uh, affecting a lot of uh, business houses in this domain of online and digital environment why because there's so the favorite three keys i would say of any person is control c control v and control a i think cut copy paste is the new indian jugad which has emerged because uh, any anybody who's going on the online domain i think uh, this is the favorite thing that they're trying to do why they're going to cut copy paste anything that and everything that is available on the internet so be 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 uh, cautioned because there is going to be a lot of ip related issues that is going to come across more specifically in the light of copyright uh, since the copyright law recently got amended and there going to be huge and strict penalties that have been in initiated specifically under uh, copyright infringement and more specifically uh, we have a section called section 63b which is a, a, a section for copyright infringement which could have uh, uh, imprisonments uh, ranging from 5 to 7 years and it could also be for 10 or 15 years in case you repeat the offense more specifically in the light of uh, intellectual property violations next slide please forgery and forged documents uh, are, are are actually trying to uh, receive uh, more um, center stage attention 
I just talk of this case that has happened uh, recently uh, and then uh, that came to my notice. Um, there was one com company secretary and a chartered accountant who were trying to uh, do a tax advice to a particular company. Well, uh, they wanted to ensure that uh, the uh, tax which is payable by the company is actually trying to be uh, reduced. So in that kind of a scenario, what has exactly happened is while preparing returns, they actually tried to forge uh, the uh, statements and then make a forged uh, return uh, as their uh, uh, prima facie for filing the income tax return for the company. So what happened in this scenario? They had uh, prepared a forged document uh, looking and uh, manipulating the facts and figures, then trying to use the forged document for the purpose of filing their returns. Lo and behold, this uh, went up to the uh, department's uh, notice and there was a raid on that business house. As a result, the computer, the laptop, everything was, was actually seized. What they found that it was interesting to note is that the original document and the forged document both were present in that particular system. And to that understanding, it primarily basically, uh, displayed their intention to cheat and do, do a criminal activity. And more significantly, not just a case on the company for doing so, but also on the chartered accountant and, and on the tax uh, company for actually trying to create and manipulate uh, forged records were actually lodged, specifically under Section 468 of the Indian Penal Code. So these are all wake-up calls, and this is also some kinds of cyber crimes that are happening. And more specifically, confidentiality uh, and privacy are some uh, two uh, basic uh, areas that need to be increasingly looked at by any business house. Now, confidential information has been shared across uh, uh, with different um, actors, whether it's the companies, the employees, or the consultants, or the affiliates, or the clients, or the customers, or the vendors. I think more specifically, uh, confidential information needs to be specifically defined so as to ensure that the confidential information is not missing any of the bits and sperms of the confidential information. I have seen that there are a lot of companies who, who make use of non-disclosure agreements and confidentiality agreements. Well, that's a good practice. No two ways about it. However, uh, more specifically, including uh, the, the uh, specific kind of information that has been shared across this domain uh, and these agreements would actually help the company to actually try to address any confidential related issues. And more specifically, privacy also is going to be increasingly uh, going to hold uh, a very important aspect, more specifically in the light that is not being declared as a fundamental. So cheating by impersonation, like I said, identity theft and cheating by impersonation are going to be the new flavor of the times because um, it's going to be very, very difficult in order to identify um, your uh, online transactions and specifically have interactions with your users. If you're, uh, if you're having any kinds of website, mobile application, or a platform that is involving users, I think you have to get prepared on these. Email related crimes, well, I, a simple example that I would like to talk of here is that if anybody makes use of official email ID and shares any of the confidential information uh, with, uh, within even their personal email ID, that becomes an email related crime. Though it's the same for making of both the email accounts. Why? Because the email accounts are supposed to be used in two different ways and doing any kinds of mismatch would land you in legal issues. The email related crimes are going to also be one of the most important uh, cyber crimes considering the business houses. Uh, more specifically, when everything goes uh, through the information exchange happening through emails. Next slide, please. And more specifically, we are all under heat because we are under a leaking ecosystem. Uh, next slide, please. Online defamation is also going to receive a, a, a lot of um, uh, areas because good, bad, or worst, um, there are lots of uh, uh, avenues open, uh, whether it's your clients or vendors or customers or employees. I think they're mounting to a lot of acts that are actually defaming and actually trying to tarnish the, the reputation of the company. I think primarily, uh, this is the key cyber crimes that's happening with online um, uh, ecosystem. You don't need an online presence. I think any business without an online presence also can be prone to online defamation issues. Fake news is a new epitome. Right? There is a completely no legislation with regard to fake news in the country. And more specifically, a good bad. Hello, I think I just, uh, I mean, it's pretty much off.
Yeah, more specifically, uh, fake news is going to be holding a very significant role because a lot of fake news have also been published regarding certain companies. Uh, recently, a client of mine uh, happened to see that uh, there was a fake news generated that they were actually suffered a cyber attack, which is actually totally uh, uh, a false news. I think um, people who are propagating fake news, who are encouraging, who are actually trying to share it, would actually face equal amounts of liabilities with regard to uh, fair, uh, uh, what do you say uh, transmission of this uh, fake news cyber security breaches have become galore why because with everything going digital i think every company but no matter what is the kind of company is actually now being targeted by cyber criminals for cyber security breaches device breaches are also going to become the new um, order of the day shall i say because with work from home being the new normal I think a lot of uh, uh, device breaches are also happening by the um, uh, advent of this pandemic situation. And if you're trying to have something called BYOD, where bring your own device, they're asking the employees to work on their own devices. I think you're opening up an invitation to disaster. Why? There could be a lot of legal, ethical uh, security issues that turn up when an employee makes use of his or her own device for the purpose of doing any kinds of official responsibilities. Next slide, please. In this kind of a scenario, you may be either sucked in as a plaintiff or a defendant or uh, increasingly uh, sometimes as both in case of BYOD or the like. And uh, ransomware, uh, like I said, is assuming a, a lot of legal significance because it's going to be a big time for, uh, for people to actually handle and tackle this concept of uh, ransomware. So you don't need to be uh, the uh, huge players. You don't need to be the uh, internet service provider. You could be anybody who's having an online presence. So it could be a typical, a typical company's website or an application could also be prone to ransomware attack. It's going to be completely a different paradigm altogether. Next slide, please. A COVID-19 has brought in a variety of uh, uh, different legal challenges for business houses. So I just want to, want to highlight uh, some of them. With phishing, uh, there's a lot of things. You know, we've been always calling this as a pandemic period. Well, apart from calling this as a pandemic period, I would also want uh, you to understand that there is an infodemic uh, activity that is happening here. Why? Um, a, a good, better words. A lot of information relating to phishing uh, is happening. Why? Because there's a lot of information relating to Corona, uh, pandemic, and COVID-19 that's actually trying to rule the internet. So um, any kinds of posts. Uh, that are, are actually relating to this may actually be uh, 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 having come some kinds of phishing attacks and if you're clicking on that you may be directed to a website which may be a fish, fish website well there are also certain uh, websites and applications that ask you to subscribe for any kinds of uh, covid 19 updates the moment you do that you may be exposed to a fish a phishing attack so phishing is going to be uh, having uh, a big time attention unauthorized access we're going to see a lot of, we already started seeing a lot of instances of unauthorized access, whether it's into online meetings or whether it's into uh, websites or whether it's in, into any kinds of forums and discussions. I think unauthorized access is also assuming a greater significance as uh, uh, the pandemic period continues. Ransomware, like I said, is assumed to be a, one of the big time uh, revolution, especially with regard to COVID-19. Identity thefts are also assuming significant uh, impacts. And cyber security breaches and computer contaminants are actually trying to be the big time uh, uh, objects in this scenario. Why? Because good, bad, or worse, a lot of virus, malware, and trojans are getting uh, themselves uh, attached to various posts relating to Corona, COVID-19, as well as COVID uh, pandemic situations. I think clicking on this could expose our systems and our business to these kinds of computer contaminants and merely sharing them would also make you legally responsible because in the eyes of law, you would be considered as a person who has actually created that particular contaminant. So it's not going to be only the big ticket players, but also any person who's actually trying to forward any post relating to COVID-19 or Corona would also be uh, committing a cyber crime with or without his knowledge. Next, next slide, please. Um, work from home is supposed to be the new normal of the world, and it's bringing in a, a lot of cyber legal issues specifically for business houses. So the primarily, uh, the, one of the aspects that uh, would uh, uh, like to happen is that data breach. So when you're asking your employees to work from home and it's the company's data, I think 
that's going to also pose in a lot of data breach obligations. More specifically, the confidential uh, obligations on the employees are also uh, trying to evaporate. More specifically, because there is a lack of um, uh, policy in this area, and confidential and privacy issues are also going to receive big time attention uh, in this work from home. Jurisdictional issue. I got this wonderful case. Let me try to just tell you here what happened from work from home. Uh, uh, there was this company who had actually issued work from home to one of its employees. The company was physically located in one country. The employee actually uh, had his native place in one another uh, one another uh, state. And what happened in this kind of a scenario? Um, he urged the company that, you know, due to this pandemic situation, he wanted to work from his native place. And the company has given him uh, a green signal. Okay, go ahead. You can work because we have a specific work from home policy. It's okay. Everything was hunky dory till such time that there was an issue. The issue was that the company uh, came to know that uh, the, the employee is actually trying to uh, share out confidential information of the company uh, to the competitors. Well, that being so, the uh, um, uh, documents being prepared, uh, whether it's your NDAs or the confidential information and the like, uh, more specifically, all these uh, have the jurisdiction as the company's place. So typically, if your uh, company is located in Hyderabad, all the jurisdiction with regard to these policies would be Hyderabad. So just imagine if the same situation, if the same data breach was committed by your employee sitting in another state, let's say Bangalore, which is in Karnataka. So what happens? It's going to bring in a lot of jurisdictional issues. I think this is one area that companies need to really um, uh, stage their attention so as to ensure that uh, these kinds of jurisdictional issues are avoided. And also device security. Now, more specifically, uh, it is also required that you update or also inform your um, uh, employees who are making use of your devices about the security aspects, like running antivirus programs, updating it, and not clicking on any kinds of uh, other uh, activities, and also doing a proper due diligence with regard to the security measures. Physical device issues and electrical issues are also trying to uh, receive big time attention. Why? I got this case where uh, one of the companies had actually given a laptop to its employee for working from home. And more specifically, the laptop had a different adapter altogether. And when the comp when an employee plugged in that uh, particular adapter into the normal electrical board uh, when, and he switched on, um, he, he was absolutely astonished that uh, there was a spark on the system. And then as a result, the system uh, was unable to get accessed. More specifically, it has actually suffered an electric uh, issue which burnt out the motherboard in the device. Uh, this is also going to be an increasingly important area that companies need to really focus on because uh, not giving an proper directions, not sanitizing your employee about uh, um, the basic due diligence would actually uh, help, uh, would actually land up in data loss as, as, as also device uh, destruction with regard to these devices. I think these are also the new things that companies need to extensively look at. Next slide, please. These are going to actually open up new manifestations. Now, uh, not having a proper uh, consent is also going to pose a very big legal challenge for companies. So for those companies who have uh, or who are trying to come up with the work from home policy, all I would say is that please have a proper consent taken from their employee. So why? Because most of the times uh, today, since we are talking about uh, this being shared over the internet and specifically over the electronic medium, so I would advocate that in case you're having uh, internal portals uh, or internal intranet portals, I would advocate you to have this policy also as part of the sign up, wherein you can collect specific consent from the employee by the way of a checkbox. And more specifically, I think uh, proper consent needs to be in, uh, obtained from all the employees so as to ensure that the employee is actually uh, aware and is actually giving consent to, this, to the specific work from home policies. So this is one important area that companies need to really trust upon in this period of uh, pandemic. Next slide, please. I think uh, 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 the work from home strategies all also, I will also talk about one uh, uh, real time case study with regard to this. I already talked to you about uh, the instance. Uh, this was the instance that I was actually trying to talk about. Um, um, let's say that a company has actually given work from home to one of this, um, to its employees, and they specifically do not have uh, 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 what is what do you say a dedicated work from home policy. So as a result, what has happened in this kind of a scenario? 
um, uh, the only physical inst- no no only physical instructions over the phone call was given to the employee and nothing no dedicated policy has happened so in this kind of a scenario when there is a, a breach of any client's confidential information what has happened is the client's confidential information was breached by the employee and as a result the client started uh, uh, getting informed about the same and it is it should legal notices not just to the uh, employee but also to the particular company now you will say how am i responsible as a company what is my responsibility and liability in case any kinds of uh, breach is committed by my employee in the work from home period well in the absence of a work from home policy i think you will have to also be uh, quickly realizing that you will also be part of this particular breach why because the law will ask you what kind of due diligence you have done so um, having some kinds of policies or guidelines in this regard would a, would try to immune you from legal liability well nevertheless you could expose yourself as a co party of the breach uh, and you could also face uh, legal liabilities and uh, um, legal actions for this breach committed by your employee so this is one interesting case study that i had thought of sharing it with you this is this is a real time one would happen to any particular individual it has happened to one of my clients next slide please uh more specifically uh, i would also suggest apart from having a device policy that you have apart from having a work from home policy also have a device policy why there are two kinds of devices here one is the company's device and more specifically one is byod so uh, both require legal policies to, to, to ensure that uh, documented due diligence has been adopted by the company and more significantly that in case of any kinds of breaches breaches uh, by their employees the companies are actually trying to uh, immune themselves from legal liability so have a specific device policy regarding the do's and don'ts of the device and when you are making your employee use their own device for the purpose of working uh, for your company i think you will have to quickly realize that a specific policy has to be de- defined Uh, uh and in order to ensure that the confidential information of the company is protected from inadvertent disclosure more specifically because that uh, personal laptop of the employee is used for a number of activities uh, by that particular employee next slide please online meetings are now trying to assume a greater significance and uh, these online meetings are bringing up a large number of legal uh, uh, specifically shall i say cyber legal manifestations why because uh, m- uh, companies are now trying to um, go and make use of uh, applications like this whether it's zooms or webex or whether it's uh, the any other application and the like i think a lot of companies are trying to make use of these applications for conducting online meetings not just with clients but also their employees a lot of scrum meetings if you are an it company you will typically be able to understand that there are a lot of scrum meetings also taking up uh, taking place through this online uh, applications more significantly if there's any breach that has been done out of these uh, uh, platforms in order to immune yourself from legal liability it's essential that you also have specific uh, policy related to online meetings as also stipulate some guidelines also if you are asking your employees to come in video for these meetings think twice why because i'm going to share out a case study that is going to actually trying to um, throw light on what exactly uh, happened in one scenario where in video meeting was called next next slide please so just like to talk of this scenario uh, one company has actually asked its employees to uh, present in person video uh, and then attend a meeting uh, which is going to be taking place the next day well an email was given to that effect to all the employees okay lo and behold everything was going fine everything was hunky dory till such time the meeting has taken place and end uh, meeting was uh, between uh, 9 am and 10 am in the morning and uh, everything was hunky dory till such time that one of the employees who is uh, uh, typically a female employee Uh, got a phone call at 7 a.m. 7 p.m. in the evening. So what happened in the scenario? The female employee who attended the meeting uh, got a phone call at 7 o'clock on her mobile phone, and increasingly uh, she was shocked that uh, people started asking her for the special lockdown services which she was providing at thousand rupees per service. She did not understand on what's happening, and then uh, she started uh, uh, to think twice. She started looking at her uh, uh, profile. and she found that somebody has created a profile fake profile of hers on the social media platform specifically facebook and they've used what uh, really uh, becomes uh, important here is that uh, her real photograph was used 
the more significantly uh, the message, the photograph uh, was actually trying to take be being taken from the online meeting which he attended in the morning a screenshot of take was taken uh, uh, a screenshot of the same was taken in the morning as and uh, was posted on the social media a real name real details real phone number was given and then uh, they claimed a message that she was providing lockdown special services to all the people at 1000 rupees per service this is a wake up call now you will say as a company what have i got to do with this case and what is my legal liability now i would like to tell you that in case you are a company who is trying to engage in online meetings you, you do not have specific guidelines or policy you would also be legally responsible why because the message is loud and clear uh, that you do not have your legal documented due diligence so this is one wake up call to all the companies that i would like to talk of uh, i think you need to be really cognizant to this fact next slide please um this is one more such slide that is uh, that, that i would like to talk of um this one more case that has happened one company trying to host their meetings through an application to through a video conferencing tool uh, uh, uh suddenly in the midst of the meeting they started receiving this that you know strangers as a, as a particular stranger has entered the call so what happens in this scenario so it's been put to an authorized access i think this is also one more area that companies need to really focus on while they're drafting out their uh, their online uh, meeting policies why because um, in such kinds of scenarios how do you tackle going forward is going to be one more interesting legal manifestation more specifically in the light of online meetings next slide please uh there was one such one more such instance where an unauthorized uh, entry was made into an online meeting room of uh, of company's discussion and more significantly uh the uh, a uh, uh, unknown stranger started defam uh, uh, sharing defamatory and obscene content and also trying to uh, abuse the company with all sorts of details um, uh, uh, whether it's uh, defaming or using abusive language or uh, and the like i think a lot of different kinds of legal challenges were posed in this kind of a scenario why because the companies never had uh, experience of such kinds of issues and more significantly uh, it is when they started organizing an awareness program for their employees and there were 500 odd employees present in the meeting so it's very embarrassing uh, uh, in that kind of a scenario more specifically uh, when you think that an unauthorized access and intrusion has taken place next slide please so i think these are all just uh, wake up calls to all of us that we need to quickly realize that our work from home policy as well as our online meeting policy needs to specifically address these issues now cyber security is going to become the uh, new ticket of the times more specifically for businesses in the light of this online ecosystem cyber security policies are uh, going to be assuming a greater significance and uh, the companies would have to have reasonable security practices and procedures in ensuring that the confidentiality integrity and authenticity are protected so these three are the uh, mantras uh, cyber security has uh, confidentiality integrity and authenticity i think you should ensure that these three are protected in your uh, cyber security policy have a cyber security policy in, in place so as to ensure that your due diligence as well as your complying to the uh, information technology rules 2011 read along with information Se technology act 2000 Uh, so this is going to be assuming a greater significance and it's going to also um, you know, give up a lot of uh, new legal and legislative mechanisms to deal with cyber security uh, legal issues uh, next slide please these three are the basic things that can make any sikkim as a secure system what i am what i have and what i know what i am is nothing but my physical self the dynamics of my handwriting my voice and uh, my uh, other things that i possess what i have is nothing but the fingerprinting the eyelid scanning and the uh, what do you say uh, other things but there is a facial recognition and what i know ultimately is the password passphrase and the pin number which ultimately is is a security mechanism i think in short any system should ideally have these three and any system is as strong as its weakest link so when you are a company when you are trying to have the basic security mechanisms in your organization i think these are the three things that you need to primarily address as you go forward next slide please now cyber security is no longer going to be uh, somewhere in the horizon i think it's already started uh, to be a part of our daily lives and it's the new age that is waiting for us and it's the cyber security age um, these kinds of uh, cyber criminals are not trying to exploit uh the fear that we have with regard to corona why because every kinds of uh, posts that you are making today whether it's on the internet 
or is whether it's on your social media, whether it's your, on your over the top applications like Facebook uh, and, and WhatsApp, you need to clearly understand that any uh, uh, website or a platform that is talking about coronavirus may be infected with uh, uh, malware or any kinds of uh, a computer contaminant which is used by cyber criminals to exploit and, and do a variety of activities including ransomware. I think clicking on them would actually try to expose ourselves. So think twice before you click or subscribe or you open up anything relating to corona. Digital coronavirus is the new star of the times. Next slide please. Um, like I said, uh, even big giants are now being uh, targeted with ransomware. Look at this energy giant in the EDP, which has been hit with 10 million ransomware threats. So it's going to be assuming a totally different uh, uh, ball game altogether. And as I see, cybersecurity is going to be the evergreen hero, more specifically in the times of pandemic. Next slide, please. And uh, uh, Maze ransomware has also tried to uh, be a demonstrative of how Indian IT giants could be targeted uh, uh, with regard to uh, ransomware attacks. I think uh, rans this is just a wake up call to tell you that uh, 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 it's going to give you a completely different message altogether. You cannot run away from the stands of uh, cyber crimes. I think cyber crimes are assuming to be the new facets of our day to day existence. Next slide, please. Darknet is going to be the new clock of anonymity. Um, why? More specifically, in this light of uh, uh, companies being trying to uh, use uh, darknet for legitimate and illegitimate purpose. So the net we access and the darknet is completely different paradigm altogether. A lot of criminal activities, cyber criminal activities are happening across darknet. And uh, more significantly, I would like to tell you that uh, three days back, one of my clients actually got a mail from the darknet stating that. Um, their product information uh, with regard to the new launch, which is likely to happen in the next 15 days, is already available with them on the darknet. And they were asked for a ransom of 1 crore rupees, appealing uh, which they said they're going to release that in public. So this is going to be the corporate threats that uh, are likely to arise from darknet. And we can no longer get away from it because it's no longer in the horizon, but it's become a part and parcel of us. Next slide, please. WhatsApp is now turned out to be the a new de facto mode in India. Why? Anything that you do, whether it's audio, video, image, or text, whether it's your professional, personal, corporate, everything this is happening through WhatsApp. I also started understanding uh, when I looked at the terms and conditions of WhatsApp that it's WhatsApp is relatively not going to have uh, much security. Why? It's not the fact that, of course, it's the fact that uh, it's end to end encrypted, but when you look at the terms and conditions, I'm clear. Why? It says that. Um, uh, any audio, video, image, or text that you're sharing becomes public information. Once it becomes information in the public domain, you can no longer seek any kinds of legal remedy. So uh, I, I had this case uh, from uh, one of my clients who, who started to use WhatsApp as their mode of communication so as to ensure that uh, they're communi communicating with the employees during this period of pandemic. I would say it, it is opening up a lot of amount of uh, uh, Pandora's box of legal exposures and companies uh, quickly have to have, have to realize that uh, these are uh, going to relatively uh, uh, going to be one of the entry points for doing cyber security breaches. I think uh, bank on target, it's going to be a completely different time altogether, more specifically in the light of WhatsApp. So uh, if you're using WhatsApp to share of any of these things twice, you could also be legally getting a notice from one of your clients for the breach of confidentiality in case you're going to share client's uh, information across WhatsApp. Next slide, please. More specifically, IoT devices, I only want to tell you two things, uh, whether it's the Amazon Alexas or the Google Homes of the world, I think they're going to pose in a lot of privacy issues. Have you ever realized that when you're trying to have any kinds of discussions uh, or online meetings, if you have any of these devices being placed near uh, to that room, there are lots of privacy issues that are going to crop up. Recently, I had a client of mine who placed his Amazon Alexa in the, in, in the place where he was actually trying to have online meeting. And uh, he, he was surprised to note that once the meeting has uh, complete, got completed, the, the particular device listened to the conversation and is also ordered something on Amazon. 
so uh, more specifically it is also given an interpretation to the conversation that it is recorded it's going to be completely evaporating the concept of privacy i think quickly we have to realize this because privacy is now going to be uh, the fundamental right of all the citizens whether it's the employee or the consultants or, or the employers also per se i think iot devices are going to hold very significant importance more specifically uh, certain uh, iot devices also have the capability of being used as an evidence i will also tell you that in some of the cases uh, this was used as a primary evidence to ensure uh, uh, to catch the culprit because it opened up a lot of conversations that were recorded not just that even your mobile phone um, uh, there are lots of mobile phones that are recording your conversations so when your moment you are using your mobile phones think twice because the concept of privacy needs to be specifically protected in this line as well next slide please you can also that you know these iot devices are not uh, are cannot be used as legal evidence Uh, i would say that any iot device uh, becomes ultimately a digital evidence and then can be used in a court of law so any recordings from them also could be primarily used against you so uh, stay away in case you're making such kinds of unwarranted conversations next slide please quantum computing has already arrived well a lot of companies like ibm and uh, google have already started developing 50 qubit and 20 qubit quantum computers these quantum computers are going to be uh, completely taking down the guards why they're going to break all the algorithms and passwords within just couple of hours and the legalities relating to quantum computing also need to be properly addressed the way we go forward this is going to be the new um, uh, ground reality i think quantum computing is also receiving center stage attention during this particular digital era next slide please wearable devices have already been the bang on the target why because everybody each one of us whether we are an employer or an employee are trying to make use of these wearable devices all i would like to say is that wearable devices also bring in a lot of cyber legal ethical policy uh, regulatory issues but when it comes to privacy why there are lots of data that we make use of for the purpose of uh, storing on this and uh, specifically in the corporate domain i would say that Uh, when you're connecting your mobile phone typically to your smart watch and the like think twice because any breach that is taking place will also expose uh, the corporate data to cyber criminals so that's one more um, uh, learning that i would like to just tell you next slide please more specifically there also is an element of data security i uh, uh, nevertheless that uh, your biometrics and the like also could be posed uh, um, what do you say a uh, threat uh, to pose to threat in case you're making use of these wearable devices specifically uh, medical uh, wearable devices and health medical devices it's not going to it just help you to identify you but it's also going to disclose a lot of personal and sensitive information about you including your health patterns to the world i think we have to quickly realize ourselves to this idea next slide please and most significantly this could also be used as an evidence so there was this one particular case where health evidence health data in a particular mobile phone was used as legal evidence i don't want to go into the uh, depth of it but I, all i want to tell you is that uh, when you're making use of these various health related applications that are inbuiltly coming up in your mobile phones uh, you should quickly realize that they're going to leave out a lot of digital and cyber trails and if you're doing anything wrong then you could be uh, under the danger of getting caught with the help of analyzing this particular health data next slide please AI is going to be uh, completely uh, um, a new paradigm as we go forward. I think uh, cyber crime earlier we have seen that it's going to be done by criminals, but thanks to artificial intelligence, cyber crime is now being also provided as a service. And more specifically, uh, I would like to highlight that uh, a lot of businesses are making use of artificial intelligence for for the purpose of their business activities. So they quickly have to understand that there's a cyber legal area that the companies need to focus. when they making use of such artificial intelligence tools why because uh, knowingly or unknowingly uh, artificial intelligence is going to bring in a variety of cyber confidentiality issues and the like there going to be a huge amount of uh, uh, hot deep waters which the companies are unaware while they are using uh, artificial intelligence next slide please um well 
uh, one uh, learning is that if you're trying to do business with any of the European Union companies, I would like to tell you that there is a new legislation that you need to be aware of. So there is something called GDPR that has been passed. It is called General uh, Data Protection uh, Regulation, which has been passed uh, by the European Union. So if you're if you're a company who's trying to handle some kinds of uh, data which is relating to uh, the personal data of European citizens, now you must be GDPR compliant. So you say why? Why should I be GDPR compliant? Well, if you are running a platform, if you are having a website, your mobile application, or providing any kinds of services to the companies or citizens located in the European Union, you'll have to quickly pay attention that GDPR compliance is going to be the new mantra that you'll have to adopt. Fail to do so, then you, that could expose you to a legal liability, which is something like 4% of your global turnover or 4 crore rupees, whichever is higher. So that's the kind of uh, legal exposure that you're going to be exposed to. Uh, so that's going to be an interestingly uh, different area because I see that there are a lot of companies that are coming to me with regard to GDPR consultation because thanks to the internet, I like this phrase, the internet has been, uh, internet has made geography as a history. So there's no longer going to be any kinds of boundaries. So if your website is going to be accessed by any person, uh, any citizen who's sitting across in the European Union, I think GDPR is uh, something that you quickly have to understand. Next slide, please. True caller, shall I say, is going to be receiving center stage attention. More specifically, that we are trying to use this for a variety of purposes. Well, I would just want to uh, highlight one particular aspect here. Um, the other day, I was uh, surprised to look at the true caller also displays your banking OTP. So just try to understand what kinds of uh, dangers that uh, uh, you, uh, uh, as a true caller user, may face. Because uh, so much so that uh, your OTP is also interpreted in terms of true caller. So just uh, uh, my suggestion is that, you know, when you're making use of these applications, have a due diligence on what permissions are supposed to be given and why they should be given and what light they have to be given. If you're able to basically understand this, I think life is going to be pretty much safe. Next slide, please. And Twitter posts are also going to be evidence. So anything that you do on your social media, WhatsApp and the like, are also going to be legal evidence. This kind of a scenario I would like to tell you that the Information Technology Act has given up something called uh, unlimited damages. So if the company is able to prove that it has suffered, um, let's say, uh, 10 million as part of the post being made by you, 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 you should be liable to pay uh, 10 million to the company. That's the kind of legal exposure and that's the kind of area that you need to really look at. It's not just going to be from the company, even your vendor or the client are also going to potentially uh, go to target you in case any such things are made about them on the social media. Next slide, please. More specifically, I would like to understand uh, and tell you that anything that you do on the digital platform is going to form part of your digital footprint. And by analyzing this digital footprint, I think one can really uh, be able to uh, do a variety of activities. You can also uh, use that for uh, forensics to track down a cyber criminal. I think this is one interesting area that every company needs to be aware of. Anything that they do using a mobile phone or a computer becomes the digital footprint. And not just the digital footprint of the company, but also of that respective stakeholder. Next slide, please. Um, I know that uh, the, 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 there are going to be a lot of legal issues. Certain computer emergency and response team is the nodal agency for cyber security. So do report any cyber security breaches uh, to certain you can just Google it. You'll get the uh, details of that and you can do a variety of activities. You can report the cyber crimes and also please, please pay attention to the notifications and the press releases being given by uh, certain in order to ensure that your business is not being targeted by any cyber criminals. I would only say that these are only uh, statutory guidelines, but uh, the, the, uh, like I said, ultimately, we do not have any kinds of idea how we could be targeted. Next slide, please. Now, the fundamental aspect that I would like to talk of uh, in today's presentation, the highlight is, is your organization or uh, is your uh, uh, business an intermediary? Well, if, uh, if that being so, if you're an intermediary, then there's a lot of legal cyber law compliance that has been um, given up for you to comply with. So what's an intermediary typically? I'll just put it in a very simple terminology. Well, if you're, if you're uh, a business house or a startup or an entrepreneur who's basically uh, collecting, processing, storing any of the electronic records and providing any service with respect to that records, you become an intermediary. So if you're a website, 
yes you are an intermediary if you are a mobile application you are an intermediary if you if you are a service based company you are an intermediary why because you collect uh, the uh, electronic uh, records from the client and provide the service to that effect if you are a product based company you are also an intermediary so basically it's no longer going to be the internet service providers of the world but anybody who's basically providing any service by collecting uh, electronic records are going to be a uh, intermediary per se so uh, uh, what is that going to be doing you are you are going to uh, be complying to the intermediary guidelines 2011 i'll also uh, take a quick look at uh, what we need to do from a legal perspective uh, next slide please so this is what i was talking to you about section 21w uh, so this is no longer going to uh, be uh, uh, narrow it's going to be broadly covering anybody and everybody who is making use of an electronic record or an information and providing the respective service with respect to that information next slide please yeah so therefore uh, as an intermediary you are supposed to do your due diligence how do you do your due diligence next slide please yeah so you you have the option to now take down unlawful content now let's say that you are an intermediary you are having a platform you have running a website or a mobile application as some information that you uh, actually encounter by way of an email you must ensure that any time you receive a complaint regarding any content you must have uh, uh, been posted that has been posted on your platform you will be getting a take down period of 36 hours from the time you actually uh, get that notification so if you get a notification from somebody through email that there is an unlawful content being displayed uh, within 36 hours on receiving that you should immediately uh, pull down the content you can do your in internal investigations that's okay that's that's the due course of the company no problem but primarily you need to ensure that you block public access to that particular piece of unlawful content failing which you would be exposed to legal liabilities which i would be talking of as you go forward next slide please so the law has come up with something called sensitive personal data or information or uh, personal information so what is sensitive personal data or information passwords financial information whether it's your credit card details debit card details bank account details biometric information sexual orientation your gender related details health and medical records and medical information apart from this any information that is required for processing a lawful contract is considered to be sensitive personal data or information and uh, uh, there is an exception let's, let's go to the next slide please any any disclosure that you are making under rti right to information act is exempt from sensitive personal data or information next slide please next slide please so the law has also come up with personal information so what is personal information any information with which i can identify an individual that is a natural person so your name your email id your phone number your uh, uh, aadhar card your driving license your pan card uh, your blood group uh, your office id everything could be, could be considered as a personal information so if you are a company typically collecting processing storing handling any of the sensitive personal data or information or personal information i think there are three takeaways that you need to be aware of so uh, as a as an intermediary and failure to do so to, could expose you to two kinds of liability civil and criminal i'll be discussing that as you go forward but just to make sure that uh, if you are collecting this of your employees or of your consultants of your or of your vendors or of your um, uh, clients you need to also have data protection agreements next next slide please failure to do so to expose you again like i said 72a is also one of the uh, criminal provisions that could be initiated against you where you will be uh, liable for three up to three years imprisonment up to 5 lakh rupees or both next slide please in the interest of time i just don't want to talk about these three because i know that there's a lot of time gap that is happening so quickly want to tell you that uh, these three are the illustrative cases wherein uh, the companies who have failed to exercise their due diligence had to pay a lot of amount as compensation and also in some cases they also the top management of the companies also went behind bars so these are the three illustrative cases uh, due to paucity of time and not getting into that but just wanted to just thought of highlighting that um, this is the kinds of uh, legal liabilities that a company could face next next slide please 
So the compliance requirements, uh, if you are having ISO 27001, I think by and large, you have complied to the uh, intermediary guidelines. More specifically, there are also certain other parameters that you need to be aware. Uh, I'll also talk about that. Also having specific data protection agreements uh, regarding sensitive personal information and personal data would also be one of the compliance uh, that you would be uh, required to do under Information Technology Act. Next slide, please. So cyber law compliance is uh, uh, defined in three basic phases. So if you're a company and if you're basically an intermediary, like I said, you need to have three things uh, as a golden uh, takeaway. Have a privacy policy, have terms and conditions, and also have a grievance mechanism. So you can declare uh, a person called a grievance officer. The appointment need not be made uh, 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 by paper. It can only be made also just by having a, a grievance uh, 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 mechanism in place. So these three are the golden guidelines for any business as far as cyber law compliance is concerned. So if you're a company, if you're an entity who's collecting, processing, dealing with sensitive personal data or information, or is also with uh, electronic records, I think you'll have to quickly realize that these three are supposed to be mandatorily uh, done by you. Next slide, please. Apart from that, you also would be required to have different data protection agreements. So data protection agreements can be with clients, with vendors, with their employees or consultants. And specifically, if you are a product or a service-based company, or if you're having some kinds of platform, I think user agreement relating to this uh, data would also be the requirement as per the guidelines. Next slide, please. So the law says three things. Exercise due diligence. Do not partner yourself with somebody who's violating the law. And third, uh, uh, comply yourself. Uh, uh, also exercise your due diligence and uh, uh, do not partner. If you do these three, life is safe. Failing which, you could expose yourself to two kinds of liability. Uh, next, next slide, please. They could be exposure to civil and criminal liability. Civil could be up to 5 crore rupees per contravention. So there are 10 contraventions you could be uh, sued for up to 50 crore rupees. And more specifically, criminal liability could be initiated against you for, uh, for a period of three years to life imprisonment and a fine ranging from 1 lakh rupees to 10 lakh rupees. Specifically, uh, the civil section is section 43, criminal section could be uh, 63, 66 and the like. So these are the two kinds of exposures uh, for your non-compliance. In addition to that, there's also section 45, which you could be actually, uh, which could be in, in invoked against you for non-compliance, which could be for uh, uh, a compensation of up to 25,000 rupees odd amount. Next slide, please. This is what I was trying to tell you in addition to this. Uh, yeah, next slide, please. So you will say who is liable? Uh, yeah, it's not just the company who is the uh, legal person that is going to be liable. The top management, the middle management, and each and every employee who is responsible for that uh, processing of data would be legally responsible. Uh, only if and if you are able to prove that the, that you have exercised uh, negligence and no diligence, that the contravention has taken place with your knowledge, and then you have exercised your due diligence. I think these three are the important aspects you need you know, aspects you need to be aware of. If you exercise your due diligence and comply with the law, do not have negligence in implementing these practices. I think life is going to be safe for you. Next slide, please. So 43, I would only want to tell you in a nutshell, uh, I think I would just like to highlight some corporate provisions uh, for businesses, uh, especially from this uh, cyber law perspective. So I just thought I just talk about these aspects. So this is the civil provision. So this could be exposed, uh, exposing uh, yourself to uh, civil contraventions that I spoke of, which is up to five crore rupees. So you don't have privacy policy, you don't have terms and conditions, you don't have grievance mechanism, you don't have a user agreement, I think 20 crore rupees, up to 20 crore rupees you could be sued for by way of damages. And not just that, there's also something called uh, unauthorized access, which will bring in a large ambit of unauthorized access related offenses. Next slide, please. So typically, if, if any person without the permission of the owner of the computer or uh, the person in charge of the computer does any of these above activities, it would be considered as a civil contravention. So for which, for each and every act, compensation could actually be got from the violator. So if you're accessing, securing access, uh, download, exchange, copying data, introducing a computer dan contaminant, damage. Damage includes both the physical as well as the electronic. Why? Because there's no uh, uh, distinction made with regard to what exactly is damage. Um, 
then uh, disrupting the computer network, designing, causing denial of access, providing Ill, uh, assistance to illegal access, charges availed, and then uh, this charges availed. I'll just give you an example. If somebody uh, gives out the Wi-Fi password of the company or any other uh, VPN password of the company to anybody else, then yes, that could be one of the charges that would be posing here. While draw, destroying, diminishing, altering uh, the value and utility of uh, any document and the computer source code thereof. I think if you're doing any of these uh, uh, these activities, I think increasingly if your employers are indulging in any of these activities, I think you can sternly take legal action on them from a civil uh, perspective. Next, next, next slide, please. Um, and more specifically, 66 is one section that is talking about computer related offenses and the like. 66B, if your employee is trying to make use of someone else's uh, mobile phone or purpose of uh, activities, then he could be charged under this section, not just for stealing the computer or a resource, but also for the data that is residing there. So data theft could also be invoked against that employee. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah, identity theft, like if, if you're making use of someone else's identity and then making use of it, yes. So that, uh, for example, uh, if, if you're uh, sending an email from one particular email ID that is not yours, uh, but uh, unfortunately what is happening is that you have, you, have done, you have committed an act of identity theft. Why? Because you're using someone else's identity. And more specifically in this light of cheating by impersonation, when you actually try to make use of that email and, and share out uh, a lot of uh, criminal uh, emails, whether it's sharing out uh, malicious uh, content or obscene posters, I think it's it's going to be originating from this particular email ID and not you. Originally, the, uh, the email owner uh, would have never done it. But in case the emails originate from his account, it is called cheating by impersonation. So you're impersonating as if it's someone else. So that's going to be increasingly one of the very big cyber crimes that is happening in the corporate environment today. And more specifically, 415, 416 also under IPC are covering cheating by impersonation. Next slide, please. A violation of personal privacy is, uh, shall I say, uh, um, uh, going to be a very indigenous crime that is happening with regard to online meetings. Like I told you the case of the female employees uh, uh, identity being used. I think uh, specific uh, uh, guidelines needs to be stipulated in terms of uh, how uh, the particular, uh, uh, what do you say, attire of people I, um, also had to be defined in terms of putting up guidelines because any indecent exposure uh, would, would actually uh, not only expose uh, the employee but also would expose the company in case the same is uh, uh, being uh, uh, what do you say targeted by any cyber criminal nor an offense of uh, what do you say personal privacy could also be invoked against the company in case there are no proper guidelines with regard to online meetings so this is one increasing different area that uh, companies needs to focus on uh, next next uh, slide please so artificial intelligence i say i already spoke of that facial recognition shall i say face is the new passport of the times and a lot of companies are trying to use facial recognition as a mode of collecting uh, attendance from their employees more specifically in this light of pandemic because it's easy for them to do so i think when you're when you're when you're making use of uh, facial recognition tools you'll have to quickly realize that um, uh, in case your application, you're your making use of third party application providers, any breach from their end would expose your uh, employees' uh, you know, facial recognition to the world. And for that also, you would have to face legal liabilities in case you've not done your due diligence. So have a specific policy relating to facial recognition, uh, describe the do's and don'ts, and ensure that you are uh, staying safe and not uh, emanating yourself to any kinds of cyber criminal activities. Next slide, please. So cyber ethics, and ethical policies are going to be the new toast of the time, shall I say, because more specifically in the light of online meetings, I think a specific policy needs to, de needs to be defined with regard to the slang and the usage of the words, because uh, I see that a lot of companies are making casual conversations in their video meetings. I think this is uh, going to be knowingly or unknowingly going to cause a lot of defamatory and derogatory kinds of uh, uh, issues because uh, interpreting that uh, in terms of libel and slander, which are uh, some of the um, um, uh, defamatory related uh, crimes, I think it's going to be completely a different paradigm altogether. 
we we'll all, we'll also have to quickly realize that cyber ethics is now receiving center stage attention and requires to be specifically addressed by companies. Next slide, please. Uh, I thought of just putting up some guidelines, cyber security guidelines for businesses. Uh, do have some employee sensitization programs, uh, not just for uh, the employees, but also for the top and middle management, so as to ensure that they're also equipped with uh, uh, what's happening on the world at regular intervals. So because, uh, like I said, there are no golden rules or the paradigms. I think we are here, uh, we, we should understand that uh, education and sensitization are going to be one of the key essentials of uh, protecting ourselves. Uh, not just that, antivirus need, tools need, needs to be in, uh, in, installed in various systems. I think not just installing them, but also trying to update them should be the need of the hour. Do regular kinds of cyber IT security audits of uh, specifically, more specifically in this line of uh, work from home, so as to ensure that your employee is not on the wrong side of the law. Report any cybercrime to search in, like I said, and also there's a website called cybercrime.gov.in. So I think increasingly, uh, we'll have to ensure that we report any kinds of cyber uh, crimes or uh, cyber issues, so as to ensure that our due diligence is also adopted from our end. Next slide, please. Uh, security settings in these online uh, learning platforms like uh, uh, Zoom or WebEx and the like should also be uh, understood. And if you have any kinds of abuse that has taken place in a meeting room, do report it to the same to the platform. Change the platform immediately. Notify all your attendees that you have been um, uh, put to a cyber uh, security um, breach. And also, employee awareness on cyber security should be the new uh, tipping point because once your employee is not aware, I think there's, there's a lot of legal exposure that uh, he can uh, uh, do on his uh, uh, side and expose the uh, company to a great amount of uh, legal liabilities. I think uh, separate uh, pro pro professional and um, uh, personal devices needs to be encouraged. So the, comp the companies needs to provide uh, some kinds of devices or some kinds of strategies to ensure that the, comp the employees not using uh, the same kinds of device for personal and professional purposes. And more specifically, password management, should I say, is also going to be uh, receiving a lot of uh, uh, attention because uh, slowly, uh, having not having pa from proper passwords and continuing with the default passwords would be a historical mistake and uh, would result in a, in a lot of uh, um, activities that could uh, percolate uh, from those uh, uh, random passwords. I think a lot of emphasis and attribution and access has to be made with regard to password management uh, as we go forward. Next slide, please. More specifically, I would say that uh, the privacy protection also has to be the new mantra. Next slide, please. Sorry. Next slide, please. No, previous slide, please. Yeah. No, privacy uh, protection plans that the businesses can adopt is have a proper privacy policy with your employees, with your clients, with your vendors, as also if you're having any products or platforms or websites, have a documented privacy policy. So what goes on to protect have a privacy policy is very clear. Uh, you can say what is the kind of information collected, how is it used, how is it processed, for to whom all is it shared, what kinds of security mechanisms you have in place to protect them, and uh, what kinds of uh, places there's going to be a legal disclosure. I think these are some areas that you can make use of as best practices. And more specifically, what has to go in a privacy policy is already mentioned under rule three, subsection one and subsection two of the IT rules 2011. And more specifically, I would like to tell that these are going to be uh, adequately, this have to be adequately protected more so when uh, the privacy is now being made the fundamental right. Next, next slide, please. Uh, I thought of just sharing with you a certain cyber legal regime, which the businesses need to adopt during this period of pandemic. So having specific work from home policies, cyber security policies, device or BYOD policies can help companies. And uh, as also um, revisiting your existing legal policies and documentation. See, uh, I see that a lot of companies have issued uh, employee agreements, NDAs and the employee handbooks and also have uh, offer letters and appointment letters and various other uh, agreements with your employees. I think it's time to revisit them so as to ensure that this work from home uh, legal nuances are also getting covered and that and those ambits and more specifically to ensure that the confidentiality and other data breach issues are well covered within the ambit of those uh, agreements as well. Next slide, please. A forced major clause needs to step in 
uh, i think it's is it's it's receiving a lot of attention and a key uh, uh, it, it's it's been uh, put as a uh, center stage uh, because with a lot of uh, clients now intending to have a post major clause i think uh, one of the mantras that i would say in this pandemic period is that the businesses can use uh, from uh, a legal perspective is have these work uh, what do you say post major clauses inser inserted and make sure that these kinds of pandemic situations are also covered under the ambit of post major and more specifically if you uh, if you are not if you are not yet had uh, these uh, clauses do make an amendment to all your existing agreements so as to ensure that your legal exposure with regard to this pandemic situation is going down to the bare minimum revisit your hr and leave policies so as to ensure that uh, these specific work from home related leaves are also being covered under that particular policy and uh, ip protection and licensing strategies would also have to be specifically understood in the light of pandemic and work from home i think specific policies in that in regard to the uh, ip protection also has to be devised as we go forward and, and not just that uh, uh, consider having cyber or data insurance lot of companies are trying to give you that uh, cover it would be advisable because it will help you from these cyber security breaches that are happening all globally all across and more specifically i would say that uh, the employees health and medical protection also has to be taken into consideration so if you are having any kinds of employees who are uh, reporting to you with regard to any of the uh, health issues i think uh, focus has to be made so as to report the same uh, to the government of india i think uh, specifically the companies need to have a specific health policy with regard to the employees in order to encourage them to report any kinds of um, covid symptoms so as to ensure that uh, their legal due diligence is done and they do not uh, contaminate the virus as for, uh, as you go forward uh, apart from this also it will be advisable that uh, you you also hope advise your employees not to click or not to subscribe for any updates which are relating to corona pandemic or covid 19 so as to ensure that they are not been targeted by any cyber criminal next slide please i think the learnings and takeaways that i would like to talk of here is that the culture of cyber security has to come into place due diligence uh, uh, is the new mantra i see that there's the world is going to uh, is going through a transition of a new cyber world order and a new world is awaiting uh, for us revisiting and drafting specific policies and agreements can be one of the key takeaways and also protecting the uh, privacy and cyber ethics can also be the new toast of the times uh, as we slowly uh, the world is uh, slowly churning out to be to the digital environment reporting cyber security breaches and abuse is going to be uh, highly advisable as also reporting any kinds of health related issues also would be uh, the need of the hour i think Uh, we'll have to understand slowly that uh, the world is going through a trinity of sisters. Um, I would say that increase in cyber crimes, increase in cyber security breaches, and fake news are the new trinity of sisters that the world is encountering. Not just that, but I would say that uh, a lot of cumulative efforts needs to also uh, happen with regard to the companies and their legal framework, so as to ensure that uh, the cyber security is now going to be uh, essentially. Uh, the key uh, uh, takeaway, and more specifically, I would say that you could not walk the walk without cyber law and cyber security. And um, closing your eyes to the sun and saying that the sun has gone away, I think that's a great, great paradigm that we all are uh, uh, likely to uh, think of. But I will say, closing your eyes to cyber laws and cyber security and saying that uh, cyber laws and cyber security are not the need of the hour, I think. it's going to be a toothless wonder and a historical mistake that we are going to try we are ever, ever trying to make this would uh, uh, ensure that um, we are going on the wrong side of the law and and the legal uh, legislation next slide please i think cyber resilience has to be uh, the new picture behind the curtains because how quickly can you respond back in case of a cyber attack a cyber resilience plan can be one of the good options uh that the companies can now look at uh with the passage of time more specifically in this line of light line of pandemic i think good bad or worse for our selfish interests uh, i think cyber resilience should assume a greater significance uh, we are all uh, complying to the it law and the uh, cyber security in breach rather than practice i think the compliance has to be unconditional and not conditional all i wish to tell you is that uh, we are all going out in rain or storm it's advisable that you carry a raincoat or an umbrella because if you do that at least you could expose uh, you could be protected from that of course there could be so many scenarios where despite having this that could expose you to um, cyber security lurking dangers but nevertheless i would say that uh, uh, it's a totally different paradigm that we we are all in 
i think uh, uh, if you are able to have uh, sanity and san- uh, sanity and prudence like i said we're going to be safe as we go forward and uh, more specifically i would like to tell you that uh, internet as a paradigm never sleeps internet as a phenomena never forgets so this is a very big uh, uh, thing that you all need need to be really uh, arriving and more specifically with a lot of new companies joining the digital bandwagon i think it's going to be completely um, hot deep waters i think we'll all have to come out of the shell and make ourselves more cyber resilient cyber due diligence and uh, uh, pay a lot of focus on cyber law and cyber security next slide please what is necessary is only what is required so i know a lot of uh, points are discussed and of course uh, uh, we could not really discuss everything in detail uh, um, more specifically due to the paucity of time i just thought of just bringing in this basic kinds of awareness and trusting uh, you upon the fact that um, cyber security has to be the new manifestation and cyber law is going to act as a key catalyst uh, thereby a lot of hope and aspiration that this kind of a pandemic situation is going to go away well the message is very loud and clear that cyber law cyber uh, security are the only digital mantras next next slide please so that's all i have from my my side uh, um, ladies and gentlemen it's a pleasure talking to all of you here and i once again thank sonali and uh, uh, the business world for giving me this wonderful opportunity to share across uh, this kinds of uh, legalities and the cyber security and the uh, uh, requirements um, uh, which are very very going to be very very important as we go forward in this digital era thank you so much i'm open to questions please thank you so much mr Sh- uh, sushan for such a wonderful session it was so descriptive so informative and i'm 100% sure that all our attendees were uh, able to take something away with it and they got to learn a lot in today's session uh unfortunately we have uh, exceeded our time limit as well so uh, i would just request you to wrap up the session uh and anything else uh, you would like to say to all our attendees you can also leave uh, your contact details in the chat box so that if any of the attendees want uh, some consultations with you they can uh, get in touch with you as well Okay, I mean, I think more or less we have covered almost everything. I think uh, uh, I'm uh, you, you. You can get in touch with me uh, through, through my contact that I'm sharing right now. I think uh, that will help you to uh, actually uh, get in touch with me as well as uh, we can we can talk across any kinds of issues. And we do provide uh, 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 legal services in the areas of cyber laws, information technology, uh, and and uh, uh, the like. i think please uh, uh, we work on this intersection of law and technology that's what that's exactly what we do we also help companies with their legal due diligence aspects so that's all i have to say from my end so let's all ensure that we are uh, safe uh, from uh, corona and also safe from digital corona virus shall i say so thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity perfect thank you so much once again mr sushan and thank you to all our uh, yeah, one, one small request that i would like to make here is if you can share this kind of a video on your facebook page uh, i think it's going to be benefiting a lot of people because it's going to it's going to it, it, since we had a lot of insightful discussion on various topics it could also help you and me as you go forward yes of course uh, we'll do that so thank you so much once again thank you to all our attendees i'm really sorry we cannot take any more questions right now because we are uh, very short of time so all our attendees if you have any questions please make sure you get in touch with me or mr sushant and we'll make sure that we answer your questions personally so yeah thank you so much once again thank you uh-huh.